Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today, we'll be discussing the history of Gringotts Wizarding Bank, as well as the magical money that it uses to fuel the wizarding economy. Gringotts was first founded in the late 15th century, during the year of 1474, by a goblin who went by the name, you guessed it, Gringot. Little is known about the goblin Gringot and his formative years, or even how old he was when he found the bank that would become the safest place for valuables in the wizarding world. What we do know is that he is featured on his own chocolate frog card, alongside the likes of famous witches and wizards such as Albus Dumbledore and Merlin. In a small way, this signifies the incredible accomplishment Gringot achieved by creating the first ever bank for magical society. The bank itself is located on the north side of the hidden locale Diagon Alley, a street magically concealed from muggles and only visited by those who are part of the wizarding world. Accessible via the wizarding pub The Leaky Cauldron, which sits upon the muggle road of Charing Cross Road, Gringotts is one of the most frequented magical establishments within central London. This, of course, is due to the fact that Gringotts is the only wizarding bank in Britain, meaning that any witch or wizard who wishes to keep their gold or other valuables safe inside a proper magical bank would need to travel to Britain and visit Gringotts to do so. Of course, this is rather unbelievable to us muggles, who seem to have a bank on every other street corner, which is made clear by Harry's reaction the first time Hagrid tells him of Gringotts' existence. Nah, first stop for us is Gringotts, Wizard's Bank. Have a sausage, they're not bad cold, and I wouldn't say no to a bit of your birthday cake, neither. Wizards have banks? Just the one, Gringotts, run by goblins. Harry dropped the bit of sausage he was holding. Goblins? Well, perhaps Harry was actually more surprised by Hagrid's mention of goblins, but I digress. Immediately noticeable to anyone who steps foot into Diagon Alley, Gringotts is taller than every other shop on the street, and has a brilliant white exterior with a set of bronze outer doors, all of which Harry admires as he approaches the bank for the first time. Gringotts, said Hagrid. They had reached a snowy white building which towered over the other little shops. Standing beside its burnished bronze doors, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold was- Yeah, that's a goblin, said Hagrid quietly, as they walked up the white stone steps towards him. Then, just inside the bronze exterior doors, is a second set of inner doors, silver in material and colours, with the following words of warning engraved upon them. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed, for those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Through these silver doors and upon actually entering the inner hall of the building, visitors are met by a large space made entirely of marble. Behind one long counter, there are more than 100 high top stools made for the goblins who work there to sit upon and to deal with the bank's patrons, and leading off the marble hall are too many doors to count. Presumably since its opening, Gringotts has been run by goblins. However, it would seem that not long after it opened its doors, the Ministry of Magic assumed management of the bank. The exact date of this takeover is unknown, but in the centuries that followed, it is one of the many controversies that have fueled the conflict between goblins and wizard kind. Despite the ministry having a hand in running Gringotts, and witches and wizards being the primary clientele of the bank, goblins do continue to run the establishment in a way that no other species can. Aside from the fact that goblins have an innate ability to understand finances and the economy, they are also able to wield one less magic that is beyond the grasp of witches and wizards. It is through this specific brand of magic that goblins are able to keep the valuables that have been deposited in Gringotts safe. For example, while some vaults use tiny golden keys to access their contents, such as Harry's vault, there are other, more secure vaults that require the magical touch of a goblin who is employed by the bank in order to open their doors. This is the case with both Bellatrix the Stranger's vault, which Harry, Ron, and Hermione access with the help of the goblin Griphook in 1998, and Albus Dumbledore's Vault 713, which Hagrid retrieves the Philosopher's Stone from in 1991, once again alongside the goblin Griphook. 
Stand back, said Griphook importantly. He stoked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Griphook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Griphook, with a rather nasty grin. To access any of these vaults with Gringotts, one must first descend underground, as the majority of the bank actually sprawls deep below the city of London. Upon leaving the marbled entrance hall, patrons of the bank find themselves in a maze of cavernous tunnels lit only by torches, and which carry on for miles. Navigation through the steeply descending tunnels is done via small, mine-like carts that only Gringotts goblins are able to operate, and which can only go at one speed. The deeper down you go, the more highly secure the vaults become. Alongside an underground lake and ravine, there are also incredibly powerful enchantments used to prevent thieves from successfully robbing the bank. From what little we know, some of these spells and enchantments include the Thief's Downfall, which is a waterfall that descends upon any number of paths that the mine-like carts travel, and effectively washes away all magic from whomever is occupying the cart. Some of the higher security vaults also use magical defenses such as the Gemino and Flagrante curses, which, when placed on an item of value, burns to the touch and then multiplies, making worthless copies of the item. These magical defenses are just some of the presumed enchantments placed on the vaults and within the maze of tunnels meant to deter people from trying to rob Gringotts, which is further explained by Hagrid to Harry back in 1991 before they visited the bank for the first time. Yeah, so you'd be mad to try and rob it, I'll tell you that. Never mess with goblins, Harry. Gringotts is the safest place in the world for anything you want to keep safe. Except maybe Hogwarts. Why would you be mad to try and rob Gringotts? Harry asked. Spells, enchantments, said Hagrid, unfolding his newspaper as he spoke. They say there's a dragon guarding the high security vaults, and then you've got to find your way. Gringotts is hundreds of miles under London, see? Deep under the underground. You'd die of hunger trying to get out, even if you did manage to get your hands on something. Oh yes, and there's also a dragon. While for many, the dragon guarding the deep vaults of Gringotts is only a myth, Harry, Ron, and Hermione discovered for certain that it was incredibly real when they broke into Gringotts in 1998. A gigantic dragon was tethered to the ground in front of them, barring access to four or five of the deepest vaults in the place. The beast's scales had turned pale and flaky during its long incarceration under the ground. Its eyes were milkily pink. Both rear legs bore heavy cuffs from which chains led to enormous pegs driven deep into the rocky floor. Its great, spiked wings folded close to its body would have filled the chamber if it spread them, and when it turned its ugly head toward them, it roared with a noise that made the rock tremble, opened its mouth and spat a jet of fire that sent them running back up the passageway. This dragon is then used by the trio to escape from Gringotts, making their adventure into the bowels of the bank one of the only known successful breaches in its entire history. Aside from this one incident, however, Gringotts has been the premier establishment for magical society to keep their valuables safe since the 15th century, housing everything from gold to jewels, treasure, and even rare magical artifacts like the Philosopher's Stone. And while us muggles are acutely aware of jewels and treasure, the gold I'm referring to here is not of the muggle variety, although I'm sure some witches and wizards do in fact choose to house bars of gold and other items made of pure gold in their vaults, but no, the gold I'm referring to, of course, is the gold galleon, the most valuable currency in magical society, at least in Britain. Cast by goblins, each galleon has a series of numbers around its edges to represent the goblin who made it. Presumably, this process of creating a galleon is done exclusively by Gringotts goblins, as the heads sign of the coin is stamped with the words Gringotts Bank. On the same side of this golden piece of currency is also the head of a wizard, with the flip side of the coin, known as the tail side, showcasing a dragon and the words Unum Galleon. Unum is Latin and may be interpreted as one, meaning the gold coins are imprinted with the words one galleon. It's believed that the first batch of galleons were cast sometime in the 1200s, as by the middle of the 13th century they were in circulation, 
throughout the wizarding community in Britain. At this point in time, it's unclear whether or not the lesser value coins of modern times existed yet. Today, however, there are three different types of British currency within the wizarding world, including the gold galleon. In addition to the galleon, there is also the silver sickle and the bronze canut. The value of each of these coins are 17 silver sickles to a galleon and 29 canuts to a sickle. Similarly to the galleon, the sickle and the canut are both cast by Gringotts goblins and have serial numbers imprinted along their edges to signify the goblin who made them. And as you may have guessed, similarly to the muggle world, the wizarding world also has various currencies across the globe. In America, they use the dragon, and in France, it's believed that the currency used by witches and wizards is the bezant. While the general history of the French bezant and when exactly it went into circulation is unknown, the American dragot is said to have been in use in the United States since at least the 1700s. There is also the possibility that the dragot has a lesser value subunit called the Sprink. For those of you who may be wondering what the conversion rate is between muggle money and wizarding money, you're not alone. There are entire websites dedicated to this exact thing. I've taken a deep dive into some of these and last I checked, one galleon was the equivalent of five British pounds. Of course, since there are a many number of muggle-born witches and wizards across the globe, there is a rather large population within the wizarding world which requires currency exchange services. As such, Gringotts is one of the only known places in the entire world where muggle-borns can exchange their money for galleons, sickles, and canuts. We even see this exchange process about to happen in 1992, when the Weasley family encounters Hermione Granger and her muggle parents on their way to exchange their British pounds for wizarding currency. But you're muggles, said Mr. Weasley delightedly. We must have a drink. What's that you've got there? Oh, you're changing muggle money. Molly, look. He pointed excitedly at the ten pound notes in Mr. Granger's hand. Presumably, if the bank is willing to exchange British pounds, then they likely also accept other foreign muggle currency, as well as foreign magical money. Although, it hardly seems fair that a muggle-born student attending Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in the United States would need to come all the way over to London in order to exchange their American dollars to dragots. Hopefully, the staff at Ilvermorny has some sort of unofficial banking exchange system in place for those students. In any case, currency that is brought to Gringotts that is not galleons, sickles, or canuts is believed to be dealt with by the goblins who work at the bank. As these goblins are responsible for casting and keeping the primary currency of the British wizarding world, it seems rather unlikely that they would then keep muggle money and other foreign currency on hand, as they wouldn't want it to compete with their own coins. It's therefore likely that Gringotts and his goblins have a process for reintegrating these currencies back into circulation within their various economies. Since both muggle money and foreign magical currency holds value, they obviously wouldn't just throw it away. Altogether more likely, at least to me, is the idea that perhaps goblins laundered British pounds, American dollars, and other muggle currencies back out into muggle communities by way of France. As for the magical monies from other countries, they probably just send that back by way of some form of goblin magic. As with muggle money, there are also instances of counterfeit magical currency. The most common example of counterfeit wizarding money is leprechaun gold. These coins are said to be made by leprechauns and are commonly found among gamblers, specifically at Quidditch matches. Although they closely resemble real gold galleons and sometimes make their way into circulations within the wizarding economy, they are distinctly different in a number of ways. For one, leprechaun gold will vanish after only a few hours. These coins can also be duplicated, whereas real galleons cannot be. That said, even if leprechaun gold made its way to Gringotts and lasted long enough for a goblin to inspect it, the employees of the bank are easily able to tell them apart from the real thing, as seen by Harry, Ron, and Hermione during their 1998 break-in. The long counter was manned by goblins sitting on high stools, serving the first customers of the day. Hermione, Ron, and Travers headed towards an old goblin, who was examining a thick gold coin through an eyeglass. Hermione allowed Travers to step ahead of her on the pretext of explaining features of the hall to Ron. The goblin tossed the coin he was holding aside, said to nobody in particular, Leprechaun, and then greeted Travers, who passed over a tiny golden key. 
which was examined and given back to him. And with that, we've come to the end of another video. What did you think? What did I miss? Please share your thoughts in the comments below, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. Who or what should I cover the history of next? Also, be sure to check out the content on Spotify, as well as extra content on my second channel, Harry Potter Theory Extra. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams, and forget to live.